So last week, we looked at uh, Jesus and Nicodemus in their conversation. And we see that Jesus is concerned with uh, the idea of regeneration, receiving new life. And we saw that this isn't a new concept that he was introducing. It was something that was in the scriptures all along. From the beginning, God has called his chosen people to a different way of living. From the beginning, new life, therefore, is not made man. We saw that. We saw that it cannot make, we cannot, sorry, rather, make it happen, or we cannot control it. And uh, we do not get to decide if we are worthy to be a part of God's kingdom. Regeneration is something that God works out for us. We cannot give ourselves new life. We cannot give others new life. And we all require new life in order to see the kingdom of God. The Jews didn't have regeneration simply because they were Jewish. Likewise, we are not saved simply because we come to church or because we call ourselves Christians. The same principle applies. So without God, we cannot live this new life and subsequently we cannot see, let alone be a part of the kingdom of God. Now, it's quite funny to think about that because Nicodemus came to Jesus because he was one of the people who would have seen Jesus doing the signs and wonders in Jerusalem. Jesus was doing something. Nicodemus would have seen that. And that's why I came to speak to Jesus about it in the first place, because of what he saw. Not probably what he heard, but because of what he saw. And he comes to Jesus. And what does Jesus say, say to him? You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you have new life, unless you're born again. You cannot see unless you're born again. So that just shows Nicodemus was looking for the wrong things. So how many of us always come to Jesus because of what we can see? We come to church because we see the people happy and having a good time and living good lives and all the rest of that. But what's the intention behind that? Do we see something nice that appeals to our human uh, nature, that appeals to our flesh? Or are we looking for something deeper? Are we looking for that spiritual change that only God can give. How often we think think we see the kingdom, but in reality we are blinded by our own egos and heart's desires and fleshy condition, as well as our need for the spectacular. Now, how many of us have heard a juicy story this last week? (laughs) How many of us want to see something juicy happen or hear about something juicy happen? That's not what this is about. This is about a heart change. And so we continue in this discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus in John 3. This evening we're looking at verses 9 to 15. John 3, 9 to 15. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen and you do not accept our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Father God, as we look at your word this evening, I pray for clarity. Pray that your spirit will open our hearts and our ears to what you have to teach us. I pray that we'll put aside our own fleshy nature now, that we'll put aside our own perceptions and our own need for the spectacular, our own egos. Help us to put all of that aside now and let your spirit talk to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? We see Nicodemus asking a simple question. Simply, Jesus says you need new life, even if you're a Jew. Nicodemus says, how can these things be? In other words, am I really not saved Do even Jews need to be born again? Is all my diligence in keeping the law and helping others keep the law, does it count for nothing? What we see here is a response that is not uncommon to us. How many of you have struggled in this last week to understand 
something that somebody else was saying. Maybe an instruction, you know, go here, then go left, then take this and put it there and change this and do that. <laughs> what? Sorry. But, so we all struggle to understand things at times. Now it's difficult enough trying to understand what normal people are saying in a normal conversation. Here's Nicodemus, the best and the brightest, having a deep theological discussion as he would have had many times with his, um, the people that were similar to him and the rest of the Pharisees. What's the word I'm looking for now? Ah, I can't remember what it is. But here's an intelligent Jewish scholar having a discussion with somebody who he considers his equal, if not slightly higher, but on the same kind of wavelength in terms of theological discussion. And yet he still struggles to understand the subject matter. This is normal, but we need to understand why he was struggling. And the problem here is that Nicodemus, like many of us, gets stuck in a particular uh, perspective a particular way of understanding things, a particular worldview. And so Nicodemus, as we know, came to that conversation as an unregenerate person, as a Pharisee, as a member of the Sanhedrin, with all these different factors that contribute to his, uh, to his perspective. And that's what he brings to the conversation. And that's why he struggles to understand, because you can't put that aside and listen to what Jesus is saying. When we come to God's word, it's not a discourse. We are not, he's not talking to us and we're not talking back and discussing these things. God's word is final. God has spoken. And so when we come to God's word, we're not fighting with God's word. We are fighting with ourselves to let God's word be the main uh, word in our hearts. We can't take it and argue it and, and argue with God about what he has said. He's the creator. He's sovereign. And so we have to be careful when we come to God's word. We have to be careful to come humbly, without any baggage, without any nonsense, without any particular worldview that we might have had growing up. You know, a big problem in the church today, so many, uh, you hear this very often. Well, we do church like this because this is how our culture understands it. Or this, this is our style of doing it. Now, with certain things, that's absolutely fine. But when you start changing the word of God because it doesn't fit your perspective, then we've got a problem. Amen? I always pray that the Holy Spirit opens our hearts and our ears to hear what he has to teach us. Our hearts, because it's full of nonsense, it's full of rubbish there that shouldn't be there. Because we are human and we are sinners. And our ears, because it's full of ear jam and we're not going to be able to hear what people are saying to us, what the preacher is saying to us. Some things here are helpful to remember. 1 Corinthians 14.33 For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. In all the churches of the saints, God is always a God of peace and not a God of confusion. God is divinely simple, which means he is his attributes, his characteristics. If God is good, God is good. There are no complications there. There's no discussion room there. God is good. If God is holy, God is holy. There's no discussion points there. There's no cracks and in-betweens and gray area. That's what we mean when we say God is simple. There's no gray areas. If God says this, God is this. 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Think over what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So yes, it's natural. We come to the God's, to God's word with uh, different per perspectives and different worldviews and different cultural inclinations and all the rest of it. We come with all this baggage, but we don't have to worry because God is a God of peace and God will give us understanding in everything. And so we never have to come to church fearing that we're not going to understand what he has to say to us. We never have to go to God's word in our quiet times and worry that we're not going to understand. So long as we bow before him on bended knee, humbly saying, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need your spirit now to make clear what you're saying to me. If we can't come humbly to the word, we're going to come with something else. 
And something else always comes from our flesh. And nothing good can come from our flesh. Amen? Verse 10, Jesus said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Who over the age of 27 here can, can remind us what we learned last week? What could that be considered? Over 27s only. Shots fired. Do you remember that from last week? <laughs> you, a teacher of Israel, you do not understand these things. So this could be a situation, an instance of shots fired. But I think there's a very deep element of sadness in Jesus' tone here. Are you a teacher of Israel, one of the best around, and yet you cannot even understand these things that have been in your scriptures all along? Are you not a teacher of Israel and you do not understand? You know, think of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. That's not shots fired. That's sadness. And that's what I think we see here with Jesus and Nicodemus. Are you not a teacher of Israel? Why do you not understand? We can see how deeply upsetting this question is to Nicodemus. Jesus is not interested in winning theological debates with teachers of the law. Jesus is not interested in debating the things of the law. He's concerned about the souls of people, the salvation of the souls of the people whom he loves. It, it's, it's deeply saddening when we think about it like that. Here's somebody who should know. Jesus says, you are a teacher of Israel. You should know. Why do you not know? And sadly, too often we could say that of so many people in the church. Teachers, deacons, pastors, home cell leaders. Normal congregants as well. We should know the word. And yet if we had to come to it, if, we, if Jesus had to come and have a discussion with us, would we ask him questions? Would we come with the perspective that he would say that to us? Are you not a Christian? Do you not call yourself one of my disciples and you do not know? Very sad Little question there in verse 10. And we get to verse 11 and 12. Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and what we bear witness to. The word witness there means is a martureo in the Greek. And it means to bear witness, to testify. And in everyday language, that means to give a good report. We all know what receiving or giving a good report looks like. Amen? When you get a happy birthday message, a good report. Amen? When somebody comes to tell you that they've made you lunch, a good report, amen. When you get an email stating that your distant relative has passed away and he's left you millions of rand, all you need to do is give your credit card details and security go to good report, amen. I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, the emails that I get from distant relatives who have money for me, I didn't know I had so many foreign relatives because the English is quite poor. And I don't know that I've got any French or German or Nigerian relatives. So <laughs> I think I must dig into my history a little bit there. <laughs> but we know what a good report is. This is what Jesus came to give, a good report about salvation. And he says, we, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen. Who's the we here? He identifies himself with the many faithful men and women who have gone before. This is not a new message. This is God's message from the beginning. Think of people like Noah, Moses, David, Elijah, the prophets, John the Baptist, etc. God has used many people to bring a good report about what he is doing. But the people do not accept the good report. The people do not accept the testimony. 
The same testimony that they all share. The same testimony that the scriptures speak to. The same scriptures that Nicodemus would have studied, with which he would have been very familiar. And yet he didn't understand the testimony. Jesus says, you do not accept our witness. You do not accept our good report. That's why this conversation with Nicodemus is more mind-boggling than we can imagine. A teacher of the Jews immersed in the scriptures obviously did not understand this testimony from Jesus, the same one that he shares with all the men and women who had gone before about God's goodness, about God's salvation. Now, obviously, in Christ Jesus, it was in the ultimate sense, and we're getting to that. His testimony is more complete and more full than that of Moses and David and all the rest. Absolutely, because he's the son of God. But the point is, the message is the same. Now, Jesus takes this point further by saying that Nicodemus cannot even understand this in earthly terms. How could he understand the things of God's kingdom? In other words, if you struggle with the basics, for example, accepting this testimony of God, accepting that we are sinners needing a savior, if we cannot even get that right. How are we going to go deeper into God's word? How are we going to understand who Jesus is? How are we going to understand what he did? How are we going to understand justification? How are we going to understand God's holiness? How are we going to understand eternal life? How are we going to have an eternal perspective or even simply an absolute moral code? If we cannot understand that we are sinners in need of a savior, who's to say that murder is wrong? Who's to say that stealing is wrong? Anything that comes from the flesh is not good. We can get all the best and brightest human thinkers in the world, put them in one room together and say, draw up the most fantastic constitution and bill of human rights that you can. And they will argue and debate. They'll come up with something. But at the end of the day, you ask them the question, on whose moral authority did you say that everyone deserves the right to shelter or the right to food? On whose moral authority did you say it's not okay to steal? And we know God has put the, you know, an element of who he is and his word on, on people's hearts. We, people know what's right and wrong. But nobody wants to say, well, nobody who, who doesn't believe wants to say that that comes from God. You know, it's the stigma of the Ten Commandments. How many of you have ever spoken with a non-believer? Oh, the Ten Commandments are too oppressive. They, they're too difficult to follow. Because that's all they can think about, the Ten Commandments. But it just shows you. That's what people know. They know the basics. Don't murder, don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet your neighbor's possessions. Honor your mother, mother and your father. You know, we get it wrong with, you know, God is one. And don't make idols and don't take the Lord's name in vain. But nobody wants to say that that comes absolutely and ultimately from God because they don't want to accept God's sovereignty over his creation. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person, the unregenerate person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. It's folly, it's foolishness. It doesn't mean anything. What's the bridge between the natural person and the things of God? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's work in regenerating the heart of a person. Now without his regenerating work in our lives, we are truly and we are always lost. If we approach a decision that we have to make and we are not led by the Holy Spirit, if we approach a moral dilemma and the word of God made clear to us by the Holy Spirit is not at the forefront of our minds and hearts, we are not going to make a good decision because nothing good can come from this flesh. Nothing good can come from my sinful nature. I can throw everything I have at this problem, at this moral dilemma. Nothing good is going to come from that. 
unless we have the help of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we are always and truly lost. If Nicodemus could not even see that he needed new life, what else could Jesus say to him? It would be like folly. He wouldn't understand it because these things are spiritually discerned. Verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven. What does this mean? Simply, heaven is Jesus' home. No man has been to heaven and can claim to understand the mysteries of God except Jesus. He comes from heaven. He was with God in the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ. He ascended into heaven, which simply means heaven is his home. That's where he comes from. He understands the place. He understands God's kingdom. He understands the mysteries of God. And he de descended means that he took on the form of a human. He became like one of us, the son of man. Now, this is a very interesting turn in the conversation because for the first time here, Jesus is now referencing his mission. His mission as the one who has come with direct authority and divine understanding. This is, what, this is what makes Jesus unique to the other prophets and other men of faith who had gone before with their testimony. Jesus is God. Jesus has direct authority. Jesus has divine understanding already without it being given to him by the Holy Spirit. He has it already. And unlike the people who had gone before, the men of, and women of faith who had gone before, he ascended into heaven. He comes from heaven. And if we take that further, we know that he is God. No man understands the mysteries of God as Jesus does. And this leads us into the rest of his mission that we see in verses 14 to 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. That story comes from Numbers 21. Nicodemus should have known this. He should have known the story, which he did. But when Jesus recalls the story, does he understand it? Does he, does he miss the point? Numbers 21, 49, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food, the manna that came from heaven. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. Who sent the venomous snakes? The Lord. Is that a bad thing that the Lord sent the venomous snakes? No, because God is good and God is holy. The Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. What do the snakes represent here? The consequences of our sin. If we're drawing a parallel to this metaphor, making a metaphor rather of this. The snakes, the people complained, and God sent snakes. That's the consequences of our sin. God told Moses to make a, a snake and lift it up on a pole. The, their salvation was the image of their sinful consequences. The consequences of their sins were biting them and killing them. So God told Moses to take that, put it on a pole, and make, it, make them look at it. They looked at what was afflicting them, hanging up on a pole for their salvation. What an amazing foreshadowing of what Jesus was to us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Moses had to take bronze and make it into a snake. Bronze wasn't a snake already. Moses had to make a snake out of the bronze. God took the perfectly righteous Jesus and made him sin so that he would bear the wrath of God. And like the Israelites in the desert, we can do nothing to save ourselves from the consequence of our sin. We cannot do anything to save ourselves. God lifted Jesus up onto a cross and we look to him and we are saved. And why? Why was he lifted up? Why must the son of man be lifted up as Moses lifted up the snake? So that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. John's purpose for writing this gospel message so that you may believe and by believing in him you may have life eternal. It's not just about regeneration but regeneration that leads to faith. We all require the Holy Spirit to give us new life. Without that new life we can do nothing. But because of what Jesus did for us he enables us to live in that new life. And we'll have a look at verse 16 onwards next, next week. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in that he gave his only one son. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So we're going to look at what eternal life means next week. It's not just about living forever. But eternal life, life in its fullest. In its fullest sense meaning in relationship with God. It's not just about living forever. It's about living forever with God in in perfect righteousness, in perfect goodness, as he initially designed in the Garden of Eden. Now all of that can be summarized in those words, eternal life. The Holy Spirit needs to regenerate us. And the grace of Jesus enables us to live in that new life. Amen. So what can we learn from this for us? Firstly, perspective can hinder us. Come humbly to God. Sinful man cannot understand a good and holy God. We need to come humbly. We need to come humbly to his word. We need to come humbly to the cross. We need to come humbly to the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. We can't bring our perspective. We can't bring our baggage. We need to cast that aside and come humbly so that he can work in us. And secondly, if you have new life, live it. The Son of Man was lifted up for you to see and be saved. So I ask you this evening, have you seen him? Have you been saved? Eternal life is still coming, but eternal life is also here and now. If Jesus had to come and ask you, are you not a Christian and yet you do not understand these things? Would he ask you that this evening? Would he ask you that during the course of the week? We need to examine our hearts and see. If you have new life, live it. If you have an old perspective, give it up. And take on this new eternal perspective that comes from his spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your word to us this evening. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for your blessings upon blessings. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for your strength and your wisdom and the work that you're doing in our lives. Father, for the times that we have come to you and to your word with our own perspectives, with our own baggage, with trying to understand things from our flesh, I pray that you will forgive us. Pray that you will cast aside everything that hinders us from coming to you. Humble us, I pray. And help us to humble ourselves that we might approach you And Father, forgive us too where we've taken for granted this new life that you have given to us. 
Forgive us where we've taken for granted you who hung up on that cross for all men to see and be saved. We have seen you, Father God. We've seen your, your son, Jesus Christ. We've received that grace. We've received the gift of regeneration by your spirit. Help us to live in that new life, I pray. Help us to remember that we are called to something greater. That eternal life starts now. That we can live by your spirit here and now. And as we go from this place, I pray that you will help us to do just that. That you will go before, that we will look to you. That we will make you our first love every second of every day. Thank you for what you're doing in these people. Thank you for what you're doing in this town. Thank you that you are building your kingdom regardless of what man can do. You will build your kingdom. And we want to be a part of that always. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We lift your name higher than any other. We worship you and adore you. And we bless you. Amen.